Okay. 47 button clicks later, it says that we're live. Hooray! And I think if I refresh the website, things are looking good. What do these people say over here? They seem to be saying, oh, that's not the right window. I think we're good. Except that we're, we're missing someone, but we just decided that uh, we'll do it with Aim this week. So, hello and welcome, everybody, to this week's ASP.NET community stand-up. We are without Mr. Hanselman this week. He is in uh, Munich, I think, John. Is that right? You know, I was going to do the thing of, we don't know where Scott is. Maybe he's on vacation, because he does that to me every time I'm gone. Oh, well, so let me start again. So, <laughs> hello and welcome to the ASP.NET community stand-up. Scott's on vacation this week. <laughs> and, uh, he just, I, I think he just like unplugged all his devices and didn't even send an email, so we're just assuming he's on vacation. And uh, so we decided we'd step in and do it on my account again this week, this week and we'll let Scott do the cleanup <laughs> next week like he did last time. <laughs> um, but we have a guest. We, uh, I dragged Mads in yes. this week. He's going to talk to us about some stuff uh, a little later on. Uh, but otherwise, and what have you been doing this week, John? I have been getting ready for uh, Red Hat Dev Nation next week. So I'm excited about that. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the same week that we're going to ship .NET Core 1.0 RTM. It sure is. Yeah, and ASP.NET Core uh, 1.0 RTM as well. So that's all still on track, as was announced. Uh, what, the .NET Conf, I think, uh, Hunter announced that? So, yep, that'll all happen next week uh, and with another preview of the tooling. We've been doing um, the nightly previews of the tooling now. You can right. get those up on GitHub, so if you're one right on the bleeding edge and you don't really care about the stability of your machine, you can get uh, nightly builds of the tooling for .NET and ASP.NET Core um, and install those for Visual Studio. Um, obviously, you can, you've been able to get nightly. What's involved in that? What's that? What's involved in the nightly tooling? Is that like run yeah, a mystery so basically, MSI? You go to the GitHub page, you download the release, it's an exe, you run it, and it updates your .NET Core SDK, it updates your Visual Studio tooling, your templates, the project system, the editing, all the stuff in VS um, to whatever the currently blessed nightly, um, nightly in air quotes, uh, build is. We don't actually release them every day, but we build, they literally come off our CI server whenever we make a change, and if it's a good build, like it has a good set of fixes in it and it doesn't like kill people, then we'll bless it as a nightly build, and we'll go. We'll turn the crank to push it up uh, to the, the unofficial channel uh, that is uh, the GitHub releases tab for the tooling repo. Um, so if you, like I said, it is bleeding edge stuff. Um, build to build upgrades are supposed to work. So build to build is means that you can install like today's nightly, and the next week you can install a different nightly over the top of that one. And then all things being wonderful, when the RTM build comes out, which will actually be tooling preview two two. Um, you would be able to install that on top of uh, these nightly builds. That's supposed to work. And I have my fingers crossed here because sometimes people, one of the issues that people find, uh, might find, are setup issues. And so you've got to install something in a break. So that's why we say these nightly, if we're going to do them, it might hurt you. Um, so yeah, so we did that. Um, but otherwise, hold on. Uh, this time next week, we'll all be a couple of days into uh, the next official build anyway. So you'll just go download it from the usual places. That's it, I think. I think it's everything. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some things going on in the ASP.NET team. So summer has started, I think, officially today, right? Today's the first day of summer, right? And so our interns have turned up. It's a very uh, long-standing Microsoft edition. We have uh, uh, summer interns who have joined the team. Do you have any on your team? No. Uh, we've got a Not couple on time. our team. Okay. Yeah, we you usually have. You usually did. Yeah. I, think, I think one of the guys on my team now was an intern on the tooling team last year. Oh. Um, Sarah was, a, was yeah, an intern. Right. Yeah, So, um, So, yeah, that often happens. Uh, but we have a couple of interns on the ASP.NET Core runtime team. Um, one of them will be working on a new piece of middleware that gives you URL rewriting capabilities. So think of uh, URL rewrite from IS or mod rewrite from Apache, but perhaps not as fully featured for the first release. Uh, but that type of thing where you can very easily say, hey, if a URL comes in that matches this, can you please rerun it through, uh, as a middleware, rerun this request uh, with this new URL derived from the first one? So we like we literally just drew some stuff on the whiteboard 17 minutes ago, um, and the intern is typing some stuff up. I've asked him to put together a, an initial issue 
um, on one of the repos to kind of capture our current thoughts, but this is very much a work in progress for the first couple of weeks. It'll be crazy. We'll, we'll completely throw out our ideas and redo it a few times, but for people who want to see it as it happens, you can go and do that. And then the other intern who I think is working on the MVC team, um, she is going to be looking at some tag helper stuff to start with. She'll be looking at writing a tag helper provider that takes all view components in your app and automatically makes them available as tag helpers, um, which is something we've prototyped a couple of times. I think Orchard in Orchard 2 has done, done a very similar thing, so we're looking to make that more of an official feature in the box. And then if we get that finished, which I think that, that shouldn't take too long, there's a bunch of um, other Razor and MVC things that I've been doing some brain dumps on the last week or two that I would love uh, the intern to have a look at if we get a chance. So there was some Razor templating things that I, that I captured, I talked about last week. There was some stuff I captured this week in a new issue on the MVC repo to do with our helpers, uh, specifically our validation helpers. So the last big MVC release where we did stuff for the validation helpers was MVC3. That was all the way back in, what, 2000 and... 10, I think it was, it was the first MVC release I was a part of. Um, and we, built, we, we, we had client-side validation, we did the unobtrusive <laughs> validation stuff. That's right, that's right. We haven't changed any of that stuff since then. And yeah. like we bootstrap in our templates right now, but you can't use... Bootstrap has a, a bunch of great primitives for building HTML forms. Um, so you can do things like make the whole form field red when there's a validation error. But that requires you to put a CSS class on a parent element when there's an error on a field, we don't have any helpers to help you do that. We don't even have a helper method that would let you easily determine if a particular field has a validation area so you can even put it in like manually into the markup. So like there's a whole bunch of sort of uh, mm -hmm. core primitives that I think are missing when it comes to building lovely expressive HTML forms using things like Bootstrap that you just can't really do properly with the helpers we have today. So I did a whole big brain dump of things like that this week and I'd love for us to kind of go through the list and knock some of those off in a point release, you know, NBC core 1.x at some point in the next, you know, um, 12 months or so. So that was cool. Um, so yeah, so, you know, interns are here, we're going to be doing some work. So if you want to have a look at what they're doing, uh, keep a, a close eye on the repos and uh, you know, commits will be happening. Other than that, the ASP.NET team is basically just doing validation right now in preparation for the release next week. We're doing a bunch of docs work. We're really trying to do a big push to get more people writing docs on the team, even engineers who typically wouldn't be uh, spending their time writing documentation. We do have a documentation team to do that. We're trying to sort of do an all-hands-on-deck approach to try and get more documentation written before we release next week. That's in .NET Core and ASP.NET Core, so that's really good. Um, and we're doing, we've just started some very high-level planning for what the next six months looks like as well, um, both in .NET Core and ASP.NET Core. Now, some of the stuff for .NET Core we've already talked about a few times. We've talk, you know, told people to the blog. We'll be giving people updates there. From ASP.NET Core, for very web-specific features, um, we've only just started talking about that. I have some very high-level, big sort of rocks in mind. And our hope is that within about 10 days after the RTM goes out next week, we'll be able to put out a sort of a, a roadmap with very high-level um, details of the uh, changes that we're planning or new features, those type of things, in all the components across the full stack. When, you know, all the way down to things like Microsoft extensions, dot configuration, all the way up to MVC, Razor, tooling, .NET Core, yada yada yada. So um, yeah, so look for that to come as well. Mads has some stuff he wants to talk to us I about. I do. Yeah. yeah. I think John's going to do community first because John loves yeah. community. I do love community. We can't leave that out. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll be quick because I we got to see what Mads is showing us. Uh, I'm going to start here with the getter screen here. So this is for Q and A. You can ask them in the in the thing, but we've also got Gitter.im slash ASP, uh, ASP.NET slash home. So that's Q&A. Um, this is Damien Bowden, and you'll notice this post is dated from September 30, 2015. So why am I mentioning it today? Well, because he's been updating it, and that is really cool. So pointing out here, here it's updated through uh, RC2. It's, it's just great to see, you know, people are writing some great quality um, content, it is difficult to update it through the different releases, but it's great to see that. So I hope hope to see people continue to update through RTM as well. Uh, so here are, uh, this is awesome, I'm getting a Skype call, all right. Um, 
Join them into the core. Let's just exactly. Open. Well, conference them in. Uh, okay, so this I've got two videos from Shahed Chowdhury. So this is one uh, deploying your apps, or your web apps using ASP.NET Core. So that's cool. And here's another one uh, on developing on Mac for C Sharp developers. So this is great. This is you know some nice short 20 minute video, and this is a nice overview. Uh, so this is Fayez, and uh, here he's talking about configuring TypeScript for ASP.NET Core apps. So he shows he's building an Angular application, and he goes through and explains a lot of the things you do as you're building up. Here's the case where he's serving up uh, static files, and he's showing a case using NPM and Gulp task um, and showing the different things you can do to set that up. So there are different ways to do that. I don't how did you find the experience, John? I've actually been thinking a little bit about our TypeScript experience today, and I'm wondering whether it's good enough and whether we should be doing a more first-class TypeScript support in ASP.NET Core. I think we should. How did yeah. you find that experience in there? Well, so, I mean, what he's, I, I'm seeing a lot of variation, and people are having to kind of reinvent this for themselves quite a bit. I mean, I know for myself, I went through this uh, developing labs for build, and there was a good amount of, okay, if you're using Angular, their docs will tell you this, but follow this part of it, but ignore this part, and you know what I mean? So I really do think that it would be nice to have something a little bit more drop-in um, to make that work a little smoother. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of think like it should just, right. like, if you do file on your ASP.NET Core app and you write a TypeScript file, it should just work. Right. So, if this mm -hmm. is, we're, so we're looking into this, and the, one of the sort of interesting things is that a lot of these new JavaScript programs, like Angular 2 and Aurelia, the only happy path, really, to use those frameworks is if you kind of uh, use the whole tool chain with Webpack, mm -hmm. NPM, all this. Not necessarily Gulp, but it could be Gulp, but it could be Webpack. And uh, it's kind of uh, going that way. So there's a lot of uh, boilerplate. There's a lot of, like, setup work in order to just print Hello World, right? And so what we're looking into is to how can we then make that better. And Steve Sanderson did some really interesting sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of brainstorm mm. projects on what that could look like in an ASP.NET uh, Core uh, scenario. And that was a great start, and we'll take a lot of that, uh, and we can use that for something. But, you know, be able to say file new Angular 2 project that has everything so hooked up. So, even before that, though, because like, you jumped immediately to, like, I'm using a SPA framework. Right. Whereas a lot of the time for the apps that I'm building these days, and I think it's true for a lot of our customers, I just want to write a bit of JavaScript, right. and I'm not using a full framework, but I'd like to write it in TypeScript as opposed mm -hmm. to JavaScript, mm -hmm. so I just want to be able to use TypeScript files and then just have that work by default in ASP.NET yeah. Core before I've got to the point where I'm actually using a full-blown SPA framework. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, think we, I think there's a step there we could do to oh, make yeah. that just easy right. as well. I just, I just went up and above, like, that scenario you're just describing yeah. is definitely coming. So okay. the TypeScript team is really busy right now on like perp and and other things, but they will get to this. Um, is that something so, for them to do or something for us to do? Like who ends like it's 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 joint. Okay, it's both of us. Okay, yeah. all right, cool. Sorry, yeah. Don. Keep going. All right, no problem. Just got a few more, and then uh, I bet Mads will cover some more of this stuff. Uh, so this is Laurent. He's talking about free HTTPS certificates for Docker containers. So he's been continuing to do a series. He's been doing HipChat, and um, so here's explaining setting up, uh, you know, certificates for that. So that's cool. Uh, Nitij, he's talking about dependency injection scenarios for ASP.NET. So it's nice seeing people just kind of go through and explain different uh, dependency injection uh, techniques. Uh, here is, uh, let me see, this is Jalpesh, and he's talking about uh, REST uh, APIs, uh, setting those up with ASP.NET Core. So this is kind of an introduction for beginners, uh, but very, some very useful stuff. Uh, this is kind of a little bit of a meta thing. So this is Meher typed up our community stand-up notes for us last week, which was really cool. So we ended up just referencing these on the official notes, um, but it was great getting his, you know, his perspective on this. So he, a lot of detail, and he, you know, he went all out on this. So that was very cool. Um, uh, Philip, so he's talking about implementing custom load behavior in Roslyn scripting. So this can be useful in, in some of the things, especially packages or things is, that you're working on. And finally, uh, David Glick, so this is looking at, uh, he's announcing Scripty, and it's an alternative to T4 for compile time code generation. So this is kind of neat. It's neat seeing what people are doing with Roslyn and building out solutions uh, using, using things like Roslyn. So 
Interesting. Cool. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think neat it's stuff. Pretty, I think that name is taken by an NPM package. Yeah, probably. I mean, yeah. everything. I think your name is taken by an NPM. <laughs> 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 but all it's not right. Not getting the dot com anymore. It's about getting the NPM package. Now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. Now it's your turn. All right, guys. All right. Who want to talk to us about? Well, uh, we have some changes that we're working on right now, or we have been in the last couple of weeks, to the project templates. Okay. In VS. In Visual Studio. This is Visual Studio, right? Um, whether the uh, the team that does the Yeoman generators, uh, I think they're actually following suit and making the same changes. Um, but the the change is basically to not have Gulp and NPM in the project template. When you say File New, HPNet Core, Web Application, you will no longer have Gulp and NPM in the template. The tooling is still there. You can still do everything that you did before. Mm. And that's very important to stress because there's been some uh, misconceptions and confusion about this on the uh, template repo on GitHub. And so I just want to make sure that we clarify like exactly what does this mean. Because we didn't just strip it away and then not replace it with it. So we're not way. removing Task Honor Explorer no. or all the any VS isms or the project no. JSON script integration or any of that stuff that we had for working with Gulp and Bower and NPM and Grunt and all those things in VS. Correct. We're just not putting them, well certainly not NPM and Gulp. Right. In the template during file new. That's right. And it was only there before to support what? What did we use it for anyway? We used it for bundling and minification. Okay. So that was the one thing. We used to have uh, a runtime component to run bundling and minification. And in in sort of before K and now core, right? And so um, this is we used Grunt originally. That was yep. actually the first implementation of the Task Bar Explorer was using Grunt. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Gulp kind of <laughs> Overtook uh, Grunt as the premier task runner um, on in the Node.js based world, and so uh, we converted to Gulp, and that was a great idea. And we built all this tooling around it that is actually phenomenal and it, really really easy to use, and it has sort of that uh, Visual Studio feel to it, right? It's not like you have to go to the command line; you don't have to care about Node. Uh, being installed or npm, any of that stuff is abstracted away. If you want to know about it and you want to install your own stuff, you can totally do that. And we haven't changed that at all. So, um, but the, the the good thing is here that with all this tooling, you decide when you want to drop to the command line, if at all. You don't have to use the command line to use any of these tools. And so that's very important to stress that that stays the same. Right? You can still use Visual Studio, uh, all, you know, the same way that you're. Uh, using Visual Studio today, basically, you don't have to drop to the command. So, um, without Gulp, we have been replacing it with uh, something called Bundler and Minifier. I should uh, share my screen here. Let's see. Here. All right. Let's see. Yeah, I think we're on here. All right. So, Bundler and Minifier is an extension. That is a year old. It has a hundred and almost one hundred forty thousand downloads. So this is not like a new thing we just uh, invented out of the blue here. It actually had have a full year of iterations and bug fixes and feature implementations and all sorts of things. And in the last couple of weeks, we've been working very hard on updating it. So back when I started this as just a extension, a hobby extension, back like a year ago. Um, I knew that there was a potential to make it .NET Core compatible. Mm -hmm. And so I architected it back then so that we can convert it to .NET Core. And that's what we've been doing. Um, and so we've done a lot of work. Uh, we've done a lot of cool things. And I want to show you exactly what it is. So the experience that you're going to get when you get the RTM bits and the tooling bits. Um, so what would you say, before we jump into this, what, what, okay. why did we make this change at all? Like, what were the driving factors between making a right. change between the preview one of the tooling and preview two? So we had, there are several reasons. Uh, we had one very specific one, which was publishing takes a long time um, because it has to do NPM install. So that's sort of how NPM restores packages like NuGet. NPM takes a long time to do so. So when you did a, a deploy to, of your website to Azure, let's say, and it ran npm install, that could take a long time. So it actually sort of made the experience kind of bad in that sense. Um, so that was one aspect. 
another aspect is uh, when we're dealing with ASP.NET Core, like that's a pretty new system to most people, right? And so they have to kind of learn all the new things about ASP.NET Core. And if they also have to learn about Node, NPM, and Gulp, then we're adding more complexity. And so what we really want is them to fall, you know, everyone to fall in love with ASP.NET Core first and foremost. Uh, and then, you know, you can always add Gulp and Grunt and all that if you want to, right? Um, but let's focus on the ASP.NET uh, scenarios, basically. So we, we're, we're dropping sort of the concept count. So that was another reason. Uh, yet a third reason was some people, they just really don't like to have node modules in their project. Mm. So one, one aspect of um, dealing with NPM is that it drops all the source files into your project. So we actually had uh, in our project templates, I think it's like 1,500 files and like five or seven megabytes of files mm. into the node modules folder. And then do you check it into source control? If you do and you use a source control that locks the files, then you can't do update of the packages. And then what? You know, there's a lot of ambiguity about how do you actually deal with, um, with this from a source control perspective, but also, from a lot of people that said it was like it was very noisy, was very noisy. They like to keep a clean project, and now we have 1,500 files, and those 1,500 I think actually are 1,800. So what we do is in the templates we remove all the stuff that you don't need mm. because it drops the source files from GitHub. So you have all like the mm -hmm. benchmark tests and the documentations and samples that's in the repos for the each individual NPM package. So we we scrub that, and that's still 1,500 files, right? So. Um, that also means when you say file new project, it's now faster because it doesn't have to lay down 1,500 files to disk. Mm. Um, so um, the fourth reason <laughs> is that not everyone believes that the solution of uh, using NPM and Gulp was the right one for the problem, which was uh, bundling and minifying. Mm. So before we used the runtime system web optimization to do that, there were no extra artifacts in the project, right? It's all runtime. It's, it's very sort of a clean experience. I think it's fair to say, though, that you could get, you're never going to get consensus amongst right. any group of developers about what the best way to do almost anything is. Right. Certainly when it comes to client side asset management, we know this is a fairly um, dynamic area where opinions and frameworks and approaches change fairly frequently. And I think the, just the, the thought process that led to our original decision to put Grunt and embrace things like NPM and Bower and then ultimately Gulp was one of looking at what the community was doing, looking at what framework authors themselves were recommending, either explicitly or implicitly, by way of when you go to the download page for like Framework X, what does it tell you to do? It says go and get it from Bower or go and get it from mm -hmm. yeah. Or if you go and use TypeScript, the TypeScript team, this is interesting, actually just announced last week, that from now on all type definitions will be delivered via exclusively through NPM. Yeah. So that you know that raises an interesting um, um, paradox for us, and that you know we we want to try and reduce um, some complexity mm. for our default file new experience, which I think is a goal that most people could um, could relate to. Mm. We want you know we want to, we want it to be functional, obviously, but we want it to be as as little concepts as possible, so you can do that sort of progressive disclosure yes. thing. But on the same on the same token, you want it to be somewhat <coughs> best of breed. It needs to be functional. So if some framework is only putting stuff on NPM, then how are you going to get that? And just to be clear, I don't think these are all problems we've solved yet. So like anything we've told you, anything we're about to be shown here doesn't solve all of these problems. I think we're kind of doing this in a bite-sized fashion. Yeah. And like a lot of the tooling that we're um, sort of working through right now, whether it be for .NET Core or the web side of things, sometimes we will have to take a perceived step back in order to take a step forward in what may be a better direction than the first one. Right. And so there is no... Like what you were saying, there is no right answer here. No, it's not that. What? So I haven't even shown what. what no, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> no, no, sorry. But, so I'm not saying that what we replaced Gulp with is better than Gulp. Like that's not the point. It's different, and you know, some people like Gulp, some people like Grunt. Right now, Webpack. Yeah. Is really uh, like moving, and so the way I look at it is like two years ago that was Grunt. Last year was the year of Gulp, right? And this year might be the year of Webpack. Well, then there was a brief period, right, where people just wanted to use NPM scripts and nothing else. Yeah, but that was that was short. Yeah. And actually, there is a if you want to do that, there's a great, great extension called NPM Task Runner out there that you can install that is really awesome. 
I think all this is great for the yeah. people who like are really into this stuff and mm -hmm. care about it. Right. But for a lot of people who just want to go farm you, I want an Ethernet right. core mm -hmm. app and I just want the basic stuff to work. Yep. I would think that like I don't want those people to care. Like I own the ASP.NET Core product, and I don't really want them mm -hmm. to have to think about this stuff. I just want things to work and be a good experience, and then have a nice grow up or integration story. It's not even a grow up story. Really. It's like, oh, I want to integrate with X because mm -hmm. X has these great features, whether it be NPM or Bolt, whatever it is, and then we can build a great story for doing that, even if it's not the default story that we're forcing into everything. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's let, let me show us some stuff. Let's see some about. stuff. So. Here is a HPNet core project. So, um, just like you would expect, like this is basically an RC2 project. So, uh, what I'm about to show you works on RC2, but it also works on uh, on RTM whenever we ship that. Um, and we have our gulp file right here. So this is the one that we know from RC2, right? What we're doing in here is that we're bringing in a couple of uh, or a few packages for concatenation, that's basically bundling, and then for minifying CSS and JavaScript. The CSS min and aquify packages here. And so that's basically what we do. We have ways to clean, that means to delete the output of our bundle. So just to be clear, bundling means you have two JavaScript files, for instance, that you want to bundle into a single, a single JavaScript file, and then you want to serve that. And you probably also want to minify it so that you get the smallest uh, thing out there. So it creates an output file with the minified bundled content. And so there are clean tasks in here to basically clean all of the outputs. And then we have the task here for minifying uh, and bundling the CSS and JavaScript. Right? So it's relatively straightforward. I think uh, most people will actually understand what this is. Um, but let's actually see what's what's actually required to run this film. So I've said, uh, you know, show all files. So no, Zoom doesn't work on Hangouts, by the way. Oh, unfortunately. All right. Well, yeah. I think Zoomit works, but the uh, built-in Zoom doesn't. See, I never used Zoomit. No, I stopped using it a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have the golf file, and we have package JSON. Package JSON is where we install our npm packages, right? And whenever we install an npm package, we get node modules. So this is the folder that's the 1,500 files, and like five or seven megabytes. Okay. So that's required to run the gulp minifier that we just saw. So what the bundler and minifier extension does is that, first of all, in our project templates, there is no extension. So this, is the, this is the strange part, right? It's a Visual Studio extension, but it isn't, we don't ship it. We're not shipping it. So what it is as well is that it's a NuGet package. It's a NuGet package running on .NET Core. And that's referenced in the project JSON. So if we look at the project JSON, you should probably zoom in. Mm. In the tool section, you see here we have bundler and minifier core. Okay. So we're bringing in a, a tool. Is that gonna, is that a Microsoft tool or is it gonna is it a community tool? It's or? a community tool. Okay. All of this is a community thing. Um, so that means that we now have some stuff available to us on the command line. And we found that to pre-compile, we call .NET bundle. So when I compile my app, we run that. So let's look at how it goes about doing that. It has one artifact in the project, and that's a JSON file that um, sets up the input and the output. Okay. So we have for a site.css, we're going to say that's the input file. And it could be multiple, and blobbing patterns are supported here as well. The output file is site.min.css inside Web Web Root. So if I now build, you can see here in the output window, now it builds the project, and it ran .NET bundle, as I specified in project JSON. And we can see that we now have the minified output. So it does exactly what. Um, Gulp did for us. Okay? So out of the box, you get sort of the same experience here. What happens the first time you open this bundle config JSON is that we're going to tell you about an extension called bundler and minifier and ask you to install it. And when you do, you get a, a few extra niceties here. So um, for instance, if we want to 
if you want to clean the output, delete all the output, you can right click the project and say delete bundle output files, for instance. Um, the same you can do on the bundle config itself right here. So didn't actually update the project. Um, you can also, if you right click, you have two JavaScript files with the, you know, they take a, a relative like it doesn't matter which one, here's a JavaScript file. You can just say minify this file. Just right click and say minify the file. It creates the min file right here. It adds it to the bundle config.json. Uh, and um, you have the full tooling experience around it. So you don't have to manually um, update the the you know the gulp file. How much of the VS experience here is is directly correlated with the command line experience? Because not all of our users are using Visual Studio. They might use this bundle. The, the tool itself is cross-platform, right? Because right? it's a it's a .NET Core tool. Right. So when you right mouse click on a thing there and you say clean or you say bundle just as one file and it did the code spit in the config file, right. can I do all those things from the command line as well? Ye well, or how much can I do from the command line? From the command line with the .NET bundle blah. Is there like arguments to bundle? There is. Okay. There is. So that's a good segue. Okay. Let's say you're not using Visual Studio. You're using Visual Studio Code. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, here is the exact same project in Visual Studio Code. So one thing we want to do is that we can go into the wiki of this bundler and minifier. And it has like a bunch of stuff, including how to set up all these tasks for VS Code. And that is actually a good segue to look at the different command line parameters. Oh, so this is using VS Code's task running system. Like they have a launch and a debug. Yeah, you can That's totally do it. Okay. So we can say here, configure task runner. We want others. It gives me a JSON file here. I can paste all this in, change the source to a web, what's it called, web application 6, save it. And now I can perform tasks like bundle. Mm. Here. And here we go. And it ran my bundle task. And I could add different tasks just by way of this file, which is a VS Code file. This is a VS Code and file. And they would show up in the palette, and then they would launch the bundle right. to do other things. I see. So, so you can run like different things. So we have, uh, you can see here what you can do, clean, and including a watch. OK. So this is basically what you want to do, right? You want to have the watcher running so that uh, whenever you change one of the input files, it automatically, and uh, save it, it automatically generates the output file. Does that integrate with .NET Watch? Not yet. So there are limitations in .NET Watch as it is today. OK. Uh, the goal is that we're going to do that. As soon as, okay. as soon as we can, we're going to do that. But right now, it's its own watch system. Um, what about if I have uh, some people on my team using Visual Studio and some using Visual Studio code? Is there a good way to keep like, tasks and kind of things in sync? Or is it kind of a developer specific, mm -hmm. each dev works differently kind of thing? Well, those two files would generally be in source control. So like the VS right. code tasks file, you can choose to put that in source control. I think it would be a rule by default. I mean, it's just a file on disk, right, in the .vs code folder. Um, and so everyone on your team who uses VS Code would get that configuration. From the VS point of view, I'm assuming the features that you showed us are just relying on the bundle config file and or just the extension. Right. So there's really no backing file other than the one you right. like. Right? The, the, uh, the Visual Studio extension uh, kind of it uses the exact same Nougat package, right? So it runs the exact same thing as you, as you would on the, com on the command line or in VS Code, um, mm -hmm. which, like, that's really nice. So you, it's the exact same experience. Um, and so, so yeah, the, it doesn't matter if you use the command line or you use uh, Studio Code, you use, or you're on a Mac or a Linux. This is tested on Mac and Linux as well, so it, it works fine. Um, the experience is going to be the same. It's just that if you use Visual Studio mm -hmm. and you want and you take the extension that we suggest that you do, you're going to get a really, really good experience. It's super fast. Um, whenever you save a file, like it's it's almost instant. And this is a great, great development experience. So people will get this in next week's release when we release mm -hmm. 10 RTM. Yep. The preview two, preview number two of the VS tooling. Yep. Um, the templates in there will use this system. Mm -hmm. So everyone will get this next week. Does the nightly, current nightly build that's available have this in it yet? No, it doesn't. Okay, this was a very this late. This is very content. new. Yeah, okay. very, very new. So I guess, and if they want to play with it ahead of time, though, the package is already on NuGet. Oh, yeah. So you could yeah. do this manually right now if you want to you know, have a really early look, look at the wiki page that you pointed to. Yeah. And we'll put that in the, it's all, in the, in the write-up. It's all in the wiki page, how to, okay. how to set up VS Code, how to do it from just the command line, how to install the extension, how to... Is there a version of it that 
that it isn't a .NET CLI tool? Is it just like an XE I can run as well yes. if I want to use the desktop app? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Cool. Did you know that? I mean, that's no the question. I heard the answer yes. Yeah, because I'm, I'm trying to think of all the questions that someone would yeah. ask. Oh, you took this thing away and you're using this thing by right. default. I mean, and just to reiterate again, yeah. this is just about what's in the template in Visual Studio and you know, potentially Yeoman and those things. And it's about having a very simple uh, sort of default experience based Nick core. This is not intended as a gold replacement. It doesn't. It's not a fully fledged task runner. But when obviously it's statically declared. It's not a scripting language. Like you, you literally just have a JSON file that can configure only what this tool can do. Correct. And I imagine this tool will grow over time. It will mm -hmm. have other features, but it'll yep. never be a fully fledged like scripted tar build system that's, like gold and those things are. That's we're not trying to right. take over for gold. Right. Like this is like okay. if you want to bundle and minify and you want to have a really nice experience doing it without. Even if you don't like Gulp or NPM, like this is for you. Like this is this is built specifically for you. Okay. And then in the templates that will be out next week, we're still using Bower for the third mm -hmm. party. So like the jQuery and those yeah. will still come about for now. Yeah. Okay. I imagine we're we're looking at that though as well. Like yes. yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that may change over that time. Change. We can talk about that as well. There's some some prototypes that you can actually download and try to they have something. Okay. That could if people want to do that, where could they look right now if they want to go and talk to you about it online or look at some bits or something like that? Uh, Twitter is always uh, uh, a good place to do it. Uh, and then on the uh, individual GitHub repo. So if you want to talk about Bundler and Minifier, go to the GitHub repo. We'll make sure there's a link to that. And uh, um, join the conversation, right? I have there's some great stuff, actually, right now. Uh, I just started like um, thinking about tag helpers. So, um, this uh, this uh, minifier that's being used is something called Inuclify. So that's a uh, brand new port of Ajax min into .NET Core. Right. And so that's uh, Alexander and Mattel. And by the way, John, from your, mm -hmm. I think it was last week's community uh, stuff, yeah. you showed uh, his Mark Dig uh, Markdown parser. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so it's really good and super fast and uh, it's really, really nice. And um, what's cool about it is it can be used at runtime. So oh, right so now I wanted to do something. Right. So <laughs> I wrote a, I did a prototype actually of a runtime bundler and minifier using that package when he just released it like a month and a half ago or so, and to create middleware, um, and it totally works. Yeah. Right. But with the bundle config JSON file that we see right here, uh, we have a way of um, reading from that. So you could share the same config between a build yeah. time versus yeah. a runtime. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Mm. So you can imagine you have like a, a tag helper call. Let's say the tag name is bundle, mm. and you give it an, the output file name. So if you uh, look at the screen here, here's an output file name, right? That, that's the key, right? So you you match it to whatever is the output file name, and then you can set environment should it be like uh, when should it use the um, the actual min file right. that's produced, or when should it write script text for each of the input files? And then also handle the request, so it maybe can do it at runtime, so you don't need artifacts. Mm. All that stuff is coming. That's so nice. imagine that there's no output artifact. You just have the bundle config. In that sense, it just sort of works as the bundle table. As either or. Right? Yeah. Or the <laughs> script manager and web forms did before that. With the added benefit that you get the full tooling, so you can just write things and minify yeah. that file. Click mm. for CSS files and say bundle and minify and put put the output over here and you know that's interesting. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, so that's really cool. All right, so um, that's coming. Thank you. I think we should do some Q and A now. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a bunch of Q and A on the Git page. I got none in Hangouts. I had to like learn how to turn on Q and A in Hangouts because it is not at all obvious. But everyone's asking Q and A in um, in in Gitter now. So I think we should. Uh, John, do you want to go through and ask these? And so uh, sure. I can look at yeah. the camera. All right, sounds and good. Can ask them so it's more interactive, you see. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm scrolling through to okay, starting with uh, so oh gosh, Zigamatis. Yes. So he has several questions. What's the difference between content root and web root? So web root is the place in your ASP.NET Core application. These are both ASP.NET Core concepts, not .NET Core concepts. .NET Core only knows about DLLs and stuff, right? Doesn't really know about content or what. Um, and the build pipeline, the compiler, understands how to take various source files and turn those into DLLs. Beyond that, everything is an app model concept. So content root and web root are concepts of the ASP.NET Core app model. 
Web root is where you will put files that will be served by your application once it, run it, once it is running on a web server. So generally in a web app, that's going to be your static files, JavaScript, CSS, stuff that you bundled and compiled with uh, the bundler, um, icon files, images, those type of things. Content root is where you have non-source code files. So they're not C-sharp files. They're not things that the compiler turned into VLLs. But they're not files that are going to be served by the web server. But they're still part of your app. So in ASP.NET Core, the obvious examples are things like MVC views. So Razor views aren't actually served by your web server. It doesn't send down index.cshtml. That mm -hmm. gets compiled by MVC. The Razor view engine compiles that into a DLL and then serves that via way of middleware. So it's not a static file. It's actually dynamic. But that's a file that's required to be in the um, application folder on your web server when it's deployed. The other one is a config file. Would, the one. would that be then where you would put stuff like, let's say you use XML or JSON as a data source to something? Right. Or well, config files, like appsettings.json is in the template. That mm -hmm. contains stuff that needs to be read by your code. Your app's runtime code has to read the contents of that file after you've published it. So it has to be in the build output, not just the build input, not the source file. So that, that's content root. That's application content. It's a terrible name. I wish we could have come up with a better name, but we kind of ran out of nouns to describe files that aren't static <laughs> files served and aren't source files in the content it's anyway. So it's that's the difference between the two. Got it. Question two from Zygomantis. If he has a project named Project One, he wants the assembly to be named company.project one. Is it possible to do that without renaming the project? I think. I think there's like there's one thing you can change. So if you're doing a pack, I think you can change the package name to be different to the project name. Or if you're doing the assembly, you can change the. He would need to look in build options. If it, if this exists, and I can't remember because we went back and forth about this, I can't remember if it happens. In project JSON, there's the build options section, which was introduced in RC2. It replaced compilation options. If it's anywhere, it'll be a setting in there. And so I can't remember off the top of my head. Sorry. Um, David would know. <laughs> All right. I can't remember. I just end up looking at the source code. But look in the schema for build options. OK, another question from Zygomantis. Will project JSON or CS proj replace assembly info.cs? Um, I don't think it will replace it. I think that that's, that's an artifact of how the compiler works. Um, mm -hmm. And the tool chain then invokes the compiler. So the compiler, uh, like Roslyn or CSC, understands assembly info.cs and uses that to stamp uh, the assembly level attributes that are declared in, in assembly info.cs get certain ones of those get carried over and stamped into aspects of the output file. So, like the assembly informational version and the assembly version and language, those type of things. So, then it, it won't be a replacement. It'll, it'll work in conjunction with just like CSPOD does today. Great. Okay. Uh, one more from Zygomantis. Is hosting.json file use, useful for anything other than setting web root? Uh, not anymore, um, because we deleted the concept of hosting.json as, as an intrinsic. You can still have a file called hosting.json, and when you call the web host builder API, you, you can say, use configuration and pass it in a configuration source that was backed by a file, and you can use that file to configure the hosting aspect of your app. Now, what are the type of things you can set in hosting? Anything that, you know, when you do web host builder and you say dot use blah, you can set mm -hmm. those things from a configuration source. So you can set URLs. You can set the name of the web server, like whether you're using Kestrel or WebListener or your own custom server. Um, you can set the content route. You can set the web route. Anything that is a concept controlled by the web host builder, most of them, you can set by way of a configuration source, which can be backed by anything in the configuration supports, which in this case includes a file. Awesome. Barack asks, will EF7 uh, support complex queries like group by on the database database side at RTM? No idea. You'd have to ask the EF team. Not sure. I hope All so. Right. Um, no one would know. Otherwise, ask a question on the issues uh, on GitHub there. OK. Well, Be Ben Adams asks, what's the why on the template bundling changes? Give us a skinny. I think you pretty much did that, right, Mads? Anything else to add there? I think you explained why. That's, that's literally yeah. the question I asked. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? Why do we do this? Yeah, I think I think we've just we've just seen the beginning of of how we can merge like great Visual Studio tooling, right click menus, um, mm -hmm. Taskbar Explorer, all that with uh, something that runs on the command line that's cross plat that that gives a great story uh, no matter what editor you use and so on. 
Um, awesome. So I think that's the future actually for a lot of other things that we're going to do, that we're going to have the, the base of a lot of features or the engine behind some features being cross-plat command line based tools that VSX tooling on top of. So we already do that. The way we handle Galt today, for instance, is exactly that. Right? We, we handle the communication with Node under the hood, you don't, so we have dragged that away from Visual Studio, but you can always drop some of the command line and do it yourself. And so this is exactly the same. It's just .NET instead of Node. Um, so we're going to see a lot more of that coming. Cool. OK. Uh, the output path for bin and object uh, for the music store xproj is set to slash artifacts. The source directory looks cleaner without the bin and obj directories. Are there any downsides to doing that? Um, so we did that in DNX, and then from the change from RC1 to RC2, I'm pretty sure we changed all those back. I can't remember. Um, are there any known downsides? Just because I don't know them doesn't mean there isn't. Um, VS has a, has a history of when you change things that perhaps aren't the default by hacking, like, you know, hand editing certain files, some things may stop working. Um, so I don't know. Actually, I honestly don't know. Um, you've, you've, you know, for CS projects and you know, VB projects, you've long been able to change the output path uh, via the project property pages or by manually changing the MS build file, the CS project file. Um, I think this is kind of the equivalent of that. I'm not sure of where the edges in that experience are. If you do that today, it probably all works perfectly fine from the command line. Um, I'm not sure if it all works perfectly fine with VS. So, and I don't know why Music Store still has it set if the other ones don't. Or if they, it is different, I'm not, I, I just don't know. All right. Okay, kind of longish question from Joseph, so you may want to skim it as well. But uh, I was curious if we have any feedback on a discussion thread. It's ASP.NET Home 1433, and this is about. Uh, it is called. Um, it looks like it's about the project based in MS Build stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah then we're, we're not talking about that here. As we, I mean, I, I, we, we 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 talked about that to death. We had Hunter on the show. Yeah. We talked about all that. There's nothing new to announce here. We're talking about ASP.NET stuff here. Cool. Um, we we will post official updates on the status of that on the .NET blog as we talked about. Cool. Okay. Related. There's a question from Giorgio, and he's asking for a design doc for that. Yeah. So of same that's same answer. Like the team is actively working. I mean, the working group, which is many teams working together as part of that effort, is currently working on that, and they will be posting updates when they have it. All right. Uh, Ben's going to make me try and pr pronounce Zopfly. I think I did it right. But So he, he asks if we can do bundle, minify, and then Zopfly gzip. Zopfly. When are we going to do Zopfly support? I think it's, it's, it's pronounced the John uh, Zupfli. What about Zopfly? Well, Zupfli. the problem with that is that we need the, the browsers to understand it. That's doesn't Chrome support Broadly now? Yeah, but we can't. And does the other browsers? Doesn't Edge um, is in progress? I thought they said it's they were going to. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. So like, because mm -hmm. like the benefits are huge from some of the tweets that I saw about. Yeah, it. I mean the new the new format for the Woof uh, the new Woof mm -hmm. format for for what's it called fonts. Fonts. It's using Broadly, right? So anyway, so. I didn't. I, there was a whole part of this I didn't show. Okay. I didn't show that you could do settings for each individual button. Right. So you can specify the minification options, they're, and they're different. Like they're different options for CSS, for CSS and JavaScript, and for mm -hmm. HTML. So it will also do HTML minification, right? And button for like templates, for instance, Angular templates, whatnot. Cool. But uh, one cool. of those options are gzip. So it will produce a .gc file. Um, they will they'll minify it, and then it will also produce a, a, a GZ file, so you can upload it to a CDN for Right. It does not use Zupli. Okay. Um, Zupli. Zupli. Okay. And by the way, the ASP.NET Core Static File Middleware doesn't yet support serving statically compressed GZIP files. It's, it is on the list of things that we want to do. I logged that issue about a year ago, and it's on the roadmap for post v one so that in that scenario, if you have like a foo.js, and a foo.js.gz mm -hmm. on the file system, and someone requested foo.js, then the static file middleware will go, oh, there's a gzip version of it here. Let me just serve that one and set right. the encoding to gzip so I don't have to do any runtime. Let's make sure that we also do that with SVG, SVGZ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me, I should add the the, the, minif the bundler minifier should also be able to do SVG. Nice. I, so it doesn't, but I'll add that. Cool. I, it just, I just thought about it. Cool. Uh, because that SVG, SVGZ is sort of a normal thing. Yep. 
Yeah, and it makes a big difference, right? That's a SVG Absolutely. being XML based, it can really shrink it down. Um, cool. Uh, so Meher is asking, will the extensions you write be natively supported in future updates of Visual Studio? What, what does that mean? Like in the box? Is that what that means? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I was well, yes and no. <laughs> uh, Web Analyzer, which was the linter extension I did that would lint uh, JavaScript and TypeScript and CSS and CoffeeScript, uh, has actually been built into the Preview 1 tool. And so that's an example of it started as an extension, and we we didn't take it in like as it as it is, right? We we wrote the features into Visual Studio. We didn't just copy in the extension. And so if you have Preview One, you don't need that extension anymore. It's you know it will just duplicate your menu items at that point. Um, but other things we're looking at. So I have a new brand new Markdown um, editor extension that I just released yesterday or Sunday, whatever. Um, again, built with uh, Alexander, the guy behind MarkDig and Enoclify. Um, it's it's phenomenal, right? And so <laughs> I think it's phenomenal. I think it's really good. It's way better. It's the best Markdown editing experience that I have ever seen. Wow. I know, I, you know, I, that says a lot, but I really yeah. believe it is. And we may bake that into Visual Studio. Whether or not we're just going to carry it in in the installer as an extension. Um, that will still be a community-based thing, open source on GitHub, people can contribute to it, or it will be us suggesting that you install it whenever you open a markdown file, for instance. We don't know yet, but I, I, I think we're going in a direction where we're going to see a lot more extensions being suggested. We kind of did that with the RC1 release in Visual Studio Update 1, where we suggested Bootstrap, uh, Snippet Pack, and Glyph Friend, two community extensions that we had nothing to do with, that we thought was really good uh, when you have bootstrap in your project, and so we might, so we're expanding that now to the bundler and minifier, to again show that little yellow bar that says, "Hey, do you want to install this extension?" And I think we're going to continue doing that with other stuff. Okay. Very cool. Uh, let me see. A uh, question uh, for, also from here asking uh, the title of your talk at NDC Oslo. Uh, Not going to help because I don't think it's been uploaded yet. Okay, I was actually looking for it while you I were talking. So. The last, they, they did a batch two days ago, and it doesn't seem to include either of the talks that David and I did, so it's not there yet. All right, keeping people in sus suspense there. Yeah. Uh, okay, question on, can you rename www.root? Yes, you can still change that. It's just a settable property on the hosting option. All right. Uh, let me see a question. Can we move, uh, from Luke, can we move this question list to Slack? Um, no, we, had a, we, we discussed this last week. Um, yeah, we yeah. Did, we did a whole thing on Hanson. We did a whole spiel about why we're using Gitter. So. All right. Uh, Vladislav, will it be possible to detect changes in files marked as embedded and rebuild project automatically when you run? Um, if it's not doing that, I would classify that a bug because embedded resources are input to the compiler, and the uh, when you .NET run, it first does a check. Uh, to it's called incremental build, right? It checks to see whether it needs mm -hmm. to do a new build based on whether the inputs for the last build output have changed. Embedded resources are considered input to the to a build, so if it's not currently doing that, then I would consider that a bug. I actually have input on that. Okay. Like, weirdly enough, which I'm not going to use. But um, so there was a bug in Visual Studio. So there's a difference between how the .NET CLI handles a build and how Visual Studio does it. Visual right. Studio has a thing in the HTML core project system called uh, quick up-to-date checking. Yep. <laughs> so it figures out when you build, does it actually need to do a build? Like, is, is the project, any of the files, dirty? And there was a problem, like, our difference between .NET CLI, because the .NET CLI would be, like, if any file changed, it would do a build. Right? And that would then run all your pre- and post-compiled scripts and so on. Which the studio wouldn't. It would only listen to changes in, in C sharp files. I see. So, that has now been fixed, and it will be in the RGM tool. There you go. Yep. The perfect guest to have on this week to answer that question. <laughs> yep. Uh, any plans to improve Visual Studio HTML or Razor tooling for web components or Polymer? <laughs> Can't be improved. What we have already is perfect. Don't you know how to use this? Yeah. That's great. No. Um, <laughs> so this is your area. Yeah. You are in the HTML yeah. editor. This is totally you. Yes. We are. So there's already some stuff in Web Essentials, but um, that sort of relies on the JavaScript engine that we have in 2015. And in Visual Studio 15, the next version that's currently in preview. It's also, right? 
We have the this salsa is... editor, the one that's shipped the uh, first time in VS Code. Yep. And so it does things a little bit differently. So we can't reuse what Web Essentials did, but we can do some other cool things. So I think Web Essentials does give you like Polymer element name intelligence. But we can do that way more dynamically. So we can automatically look at your JavaScript and see when you register a component and give and provide that in HTML intelligence. So, um, so right now I do that with the Vue.js. I want to do it with Knockout as well. So I have a Vue, if you're using Vue.js, I have an extension called Vue.js uh, pack that might be interesting to you. So the exact same approach can be used. And so I'm looking into how we can do that. Um, so yes, cool. it's not, we, I don't have a timeline. Cool. Uh, let me, well, they're okay. Does the ASP.NET team have an opinion on Aurelia? I love what they're doing for the client side. They have a unique framework. Uh, does the team have an opinion? No, not really. Um, we, my personal opinion is you should use what makes you happy. Um, I don't build web applications for a living anymore, so I'm not going to tell you what's the best thing for your scenario. It's been six years, seven years since I did that. I certainly build apps occasionally, like the app that's running this you know, thing right now. Um, but they're, like, they're not complicated by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Steve Sanderson on our team has done a lot more work recently working with SPA frameworks of depth. He's done a bunch of work with React and uh, Redux and Angular 1 and Angular 2. Um, and obviously, he was one of the authors of Knockout. Um, I'm not sure if he's looked at Aurelia. I'm assuming he's at least given it a cursory glance, if not, if, if, if not something more. Um, but beyond that, I think people should use what they like. We we can't make a fantastic end-to-end -end experience for every JavaScript framework on the planet, obviously. We have gone in down, and you've talked about this a lot in your talks, like we've got we've chosen to go on a little further uh, sort of in the experience investment um, for certain frameworks. We did some stuff for Knockout in the editor, we've done stuff for uh, Angular, we've done stuff for Bootstrap, we're doing mm -hmm. stuff as Anderson, as I said, who works in the ASP.NET team has been doing work on React and Redux and Webpack and Angular um, and Node in looking at how we can integrate a lot of these client-side frameworks and the associated build systems with the ASP.NET Core runtime, so you can kind of get the best of both worlds. That stuff is all very much beta right now, and we're really looking for people to use it and give feedback. Um, I mean, frankly, right now, that stuff, I think, is very appealing to people who are already using those frameworks. They've already make, made the decision to use Framework X with ASP.NET Core. This is kind of just like you know peanut butter and jelly. They put them together and we do the best possible thing. But if you're new, um, there's a lot of concepts to kind of shove down your throat as a recommended solution um, right out of the gate. So you know we're kind of not ready to say this is the blessed stack of 74 different components that you should use and we're going to support them for a long time. Um, I'm just not convinced yet that that's the right thing for the vast majority of our customers, of which there are millions that we have to kind of serve. Um, mm. But I think you should use what is, you know, if you're going to be a well-rounded web developer, I don't think it's at all controversial to say that you should probably know some JavaScript. You should probably be looking at, that means modern JavaScript, so like ES 2015, TypeScript, other things like that. You should probably know a little bit of CSS. You might want to look at things like LESS or SAS. Um, you need to understand what it means to take dependencies on client libraries that use those technologies and what mechanism you use to get those libraries, which is different to the server-side mechanisms. And then you need to understand the different uh, strategies for sharing data and then using frameworks that kind of abstract all these things away uh, between the server-side and the client-side, whether that be just doing AJAX or, or some of the newer APIs like Fetch and Push that are coming down the pipe from the W3C and the browser vendors, or whether it's going full on into more spa type things or just sort of, or even you know, things like Knockout and Backbone or whether you're going all the way to things like um, uh, Ember and uh, Angular and uh, Aurelia and React and then things that extend that, like Redux and Web Components and Polymer and like, yeah, it, it, web development, let me be fair though, let me be clear though, I've, wor I've worked as a web developer for, or in this area for many, many years now, since the very beginning of the web, and it's never been a cakewalk, like it's always been complicated. Back, you know, 10 years ago, it was cross browser stuff we had to worry about. Is what you know, IE7 killed us all, and you know, IE6 was easy, and then IE7 killed everyone, and then Firefox was great, um, and then but then we had to worry about cross browser. You do this CSS, it wouldn't work here. You have to clear float bug, and blah 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 blah. IE8 was the first one to implement most of CSS 2.1, which was great, except not as many people were using IE by that point, and no one else supported CSS 2.1 by that point, so what was the point? And so you still had to do like, people say, how do I learn CSS? And I go, spend five <laughs> years doing what I did, do it the yeah. hard way? I don't know how to do it in a week. 
That stuff is hard. At least the cross-browser thing with the advent of Safari on the iPhone seven years ago and now you know, Chrome taking over the desktop um, and Edge being you know, super um, sort of progressive in the, in the features they're supporting. And now for me, Firefox is you know, fantastic. I haven't used it recently, but I know Syed uses it, and it looks wonderful. You use it. Um, the parity and type of the, the, the features that the vast majority of web, application use, the web applications use now, the core ECMAScript features, the core HTML5 features, the core CSS features, that stuff is just like, yeah, I can use all of it. You know, mm -hmm. It works on mobile. It pretty much just works everywhere. Um, and then now the features that you have to worry about when it comes to cross-browser are the much more modern ones, which is, I think is a, much, is a big improvement on where we were from five years ago, which is like, can I do float left without, you know, without it working? Right. And I have to think about it. Well, no, you couldn't <laughs> back in 2008. So I think that at least is better. Um, but the reality is web development, because of its reach, is going to be much more complex. It's just, unfortunately, it just seems to be the way it happens. Is that if something is very open, the open is fundamentally a web, an open. The web is fundamentally an open platform. Then these, there's always going to be gray areas. There's always going to be things where one thing works here, it doesn't quite work there. And our jobs as web developers is to figure out which are the right tools to use right now for this particular problem I'm solving. Whether that problem is as simple as the next five lines of code I have to write, or this multi-year project that I'm about to embark on that has to serve the next 15 years for this particular client. doesn't matter. You'll get different answers depending on what the scope is. But I don't think we're ever going to get to a position where there's one stack that's blessed that is called the web, and you never mm -hmm. have to think about it, and you read the spec, and it just works. Like, it's just not I mean, right. going to happen. The last so thing the original that was question was Aurelia, right? And so we will yeah. have, it will be, so there is, in Web Essentials, has some Aurelia-specific tooling, uh, mm -hmm. but expect a specific, like a, a really a specific extension to come out at some point. We are ta we are talking with the team, uh, Rob and uh, Ashley Grant and I. We wrote the supporting Web Essentials back like a year and a, two years ago, a year ago. It's not be fair to say we're following like as a team. Yeah. If there's any opinion, we're following customers. So right. if customers, if we see a, a certain swell, a mass of customers asking about Framework X, mm -hmm. then we will do work to support it. Like for example, you're a big advocate of getting the React editor. Right in VS, mm -hmm. because we had a lot of customers asking for JSX out of the support, mm -hmm. and then subsequently type, the TypeScript TSX and the TypeScript team supported that, because customers were asking for it. We knew we were going to throw away the code. Right. And so that's what happened. So the code lived in Visual Studio 2015, and it dies with Visual Studio 2015. Because there's a better because thing? Because the new JavaScript TypeScript right, editor in, in VS 15 takes over. So it. Aurelia will be another one of those things. If we see a lot of customers asking, for Aurelia light up like specific features, then I imagine we would yeah. do some stuff. I, so I, I already have like set time aside to play with the extension to get it up and running. It's cool. It's a little complex the way they do IntelliSense, but it can be done. Cool. Uh, our MVC core RC2 views debuggable. I don't think so. Wasn't there a bug in the RC2 laser editor that you couldn't oh. set a breakpoint and hit F5? Yeah. I think that was. Oh, was that fixed? Was it fixed? So we had we had one bug earlier, which is that the breakpoints would mm -hmm. duplicate every time you ran right. through the page right. or edited the page, and they would never go away. But I don't know if we actually wasn't there some issue yeah, with it not was. working at all. But it was it was it was a part of a bigger story because right. JavaScript breakpoints. So you, when you debug JavaScript into Explorer, uh, they didn't hit in ratio views, but then they did. But then the C sharp ones did not, and then they mm -hmm. duplicated. It was like a weird something weird was going on. And I think we fixed the C sharp one, the razor one specifically. Okay, so the, the fact that someone is asking that question can only mean two things. Either they've tried it and it doesn't, and it's a loaded question because they already know the answer. Right. Or they haven't tried it yet and they honestly want to know before they go ahead and try it. And they don't have the tool in because you would just try it if you had uh, the tool right. in. Right? That's what I was about to do was try it and see if it works. I honestly don't know. All I would do is just try it. And if it doesn't, I, all I can say is that we will endeavor to get that fixed again because I know people yeah. like that feature. Definitely. All right. Uh, any plans to support inline HTML templates and Angular 2 TypeScript files, IntelliSense and coloring? Yeah, so you're talking about TSX, like having, like you have React JSX files, you are able to put uh, HTML mm -hmm. or XML, like it is actually. Uh, oh, right, right, right. But if yep. you mean that for, for TypeScript, then yes, that's supported right now. It's called, you know, rename your TypeScript file to, instead of .ts, call it .tsx. I think that came out in type 1.8, but yeah. it may be 2.0, which is I not. I thought it was efficient. in 1.x. Oh, maybe not. I thought it was in. No. I thought TSX was in 1. Point something. 1.8. Okay. It is in Visual Studio Update 2. And that works for Angular as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And React. Yeah. Cool. 
A uh, reminder from Brandon, he's asking if we're still planning on doing the FAQ or KB site uh, we talked about a few stand-ups back. Have and we not done that yet? We have not. We really oh, need to do suck. that. I no, we've, we've, we, we've been saying, we'll do it after RTM. Jeff, uh, if you're watching, when you write up the committee stand-up this week, <laughs> you just like go and spend another 40 hours condensing the last year of stand-up into an FAQ for us? Like, <laughs> I think really a lot of it could even be like a gist or a markdown page on a repo, you know. Yeah, <laughs> if someone wants to submit a like bootstrap it for us and seed it with a, the initial twenty questions, by all means, do that, yeah. and we will, yeah, we will use that as the beginning. Uh, all right, let me see. Any improvements for RESX files, ResX files in the next VS version, editing experience, etc.? No, not really. Not that I'm aware of. No, no improvements for ResX as it stands in the next VS version that I'm aware of. Our team doesn't own that, so I, I can't say that with all authority. Um, but I'm not aware of any. All right. I'm trying to speed through some of these here. Uh, ASP.NET, uh, okay. Any thoughts about spin plus turn middleware for WebRTC plus object RTC? That's got to be Ben, right? That is Ben. <laughs> no, no, no thought about that. I have... We have. I haven't really taken a a, um, a a good look at the RTC stuff. Um, we are going to be doing SignalR uh, after you know, as of next week. Once we've shipped RTM, we'll, we'll be spinning a bunch of the developers here up on doing SignalR work, which will include putting out a long-standing two two one release that we've had ready to go out, but our servicing release that we just haven't shipped yet. And then starting the work on SignalR Core, which is the port of SignalR to .NET mm -hmm. Core, and you know, similar to what we've done for, for MVC on ASP.NET Core. Um, and the rewrite of the JavaScript client, and the c -sharp client, and that, and that. Um, WebRTC has certainly come up as something um, that, that people might be interested in once they start using real time in their app. I have no idea what object RTC is. I can have a guess by, by the name of it, but I haven't looked at it at all. Um, ben, I will make a commitment to you that when we start looking at signal or stuff, I will spend some time uh, looking at those things. If, again, uh, Ben, if you want to create an issue on the signal or repo with your thoughts about how you think we could uh, you know, do something as the ASP.NET team to make using these things uh, easier, I'm all ears. Uh, a spin and turn the discovery and like NAT, reverse NAT bits of that, because if they are, then I'm awfully scared and I don't think we'll ever do those things. Um, <laughs> but if they're not, then educate me, and I'll, I'll go and look, find out about them, and we can look at it. All right. Uh, hopefully, just a few more here. Wrap up. Uh, can we enable some of the extra tooling features in .NET Core library projects? Things like file nest, or oh, and uh, then a different question: Will we have file nesting for .html.js? So I'm not quite sure what those extra tooling features uh, he's referring to. Are um, obviously part of the you know, the whole Xproj versus CSproj thing. Um, there was a bunch of features we added in the Xproj system, but there's a bunch of stuff you can't do because it's not CSproj. And the whole goal of moving back to MS Build and back to CSproj is that we'll get all the MS Build features back while we also bring in all the great stuff that we did in Xproj to the CS uh, CSproj based stuff. Things like file nesting, I know, is definitely on the list right. for the new CSproj project system that's in VS15. So there was a meeting last week I was a part of, and that that item was definitely there. So that will that will be there. Mm -hmm. Certainly on the list anyway. I mean things get cut all the time, but that is certainly on the list. And it'll right probably now. be configurable, so you can right. determine what files go under where. And so I think I think they said there would be a convention by default, yeah. and you'll be able to change it if you want to, and I'll come back up. All right, uh, I'll take two more here, and then I'll be done. Uh, it's, it's whoa, this is a challenge here. Nobody can answer this. Uh, is it possible to use data protection without an encryption key I generated outside of .NET, or with an encryption key I generated outside of .NET? I need to encrypt data outside of my .NET Core app and then decrypt the data inside my .NET Core app. So, no idea. Um, my <laughs> understanding of the data protection API is it is explicitly designed around mm -hmm. protect and unprotect scenarios. That is, it is, is, it ex it is expected to be involved in both the key management, the encryption, and then the decryption side of things. Um, if you want to do anything other than that, then you're down to doing the raw cryptography yourself. That doesn't mean implementing the crypto itself. It means that you have to create an instance of the crypto algorithm class using the .NET Crypto APIs yourself, and then give it, you know, point it at the key that you have derived and generated elsewhere, 
and then do the description that way. I have no idea what I'm talking about, though, so you need to actually talk to someone who knows about .NET Crypto. Barry Dorans is who you want to talk to on our team to get a definitive answer there, um, and you can hit him up on GitHub at BlowDart or on Twitter at, at BlowDart as well. But my hunch is that's the answer. All right. But if I'm, last, wrong, then I'm happy to be wrong. Last one, and I'm not sure I understand what he's asking. Maybe you will. Any possibility of deeper nesting beyond area controller action, maybe with an extra attribute without using routing? Um, so I'm guessing they're meaning can I create more sort of modular levels for the various parts of my ASP.NET application while mm -hmm. still having a pattern based route and convention based discovery? Um, or even configuration-based discovery uh, to find the controllers and to find the views based on the action method that returns the view result, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my understanding is you can do all that right now. Um, if not before, or if you couldn't do it before easily, you could always plug in and replace certain aspects. We introduced a new thing in MVC core called app model or application model, which lets you change a very large amount of the things that people typically had to replace components of MVC with before just by sending configuration, basically, uh, by changing uh, properties on the app model during the configuration phase of your app. And then the other part we did in RC2 was a thing called application parts, which is a terrible name because I don't think there was a PM involved. It was just the developers who came up with that name. Um, not that we always come up with good names either. I come up with terrible names. But it was called application parts, and this is basically being able to take bits of your HPNet, uh, MVC application and componentize them into modules. I would have just called it modules. Um, so you can have mm -hmm. a controller and a tag helper and a view component and a filter, and you can package all that up into a DLL, put it in a NuGet package, reference it from your app, and then have it kind of magically be discovered because you plugged it in as an application part. We don't support views in that model yet. So you still, we still don't have a first class way of sharing views across applications, but that's something that we are looking to tackle uh, post v1, and we will plug it into this application parts thing. So if there's something that you can't do right now, um, we'd need to know more details. So there's a lot of question on the MVC repo, log an issue, we'll mark it as a question, and we'll get the team to answer it and help you through that. OK. Yeah, we featured a few posts uh, over you know, the past few months using the iView location expander. That gives you quite a bit of flexibility, right? I mean, you can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, Guy Rex just answered, or Luke Latham just answered the, or provided an answer, I don't know whether it's correct or not, uh, about the Data Protect stuff, and I'm always very careful whenever I try and make a statement about, yes, this is the correct answer for this crypto question. Um, so, take this with a ginormous container full of salt. But he said that with Data Protection, you can replace IXML decryptor and IXML encryptor to implement a custom encryption that uses your key. That uses the word custom and encryption in the same sentence. Yeah. The living bejesus out of me. So I would not recommend you do that off the bat without understanding a lot more about what that actually means. I imagine if you were going to do that in the safest way possible, you would implement an IXML decryptor and then just call into one of the .NET decryption APIs where you manually pass in the key that you've retrieved from some other store. But again, I delegate completely to the uh, crypto experts um, on the .NET team, and our person is Barry Dorans, so talk to him. All right. Well, it is 4.59 PM. Yep. And as, as you all know, I am a 9 to 5 coder. So Yeah, you're going to check out right now, right? As I am. <laughs> it's, it's so, yeah. um, all right, so it's uh, time. Was there one thing left, which is, uh, what is it? What do we call it? Dramatic Dramatic Dramatic. Dramatic. That's what it is. <laughs> so goodbye, everybody. Scott will be back next week, I hope, maybe. Come back from vacation, Scott. <laughs>